And to move everyone out there in Facebook land, we're here again for our third lead in Bible study at the Road Angel Prophet Center at 1866 on I 70 in Illinois, just outside the little town of Brownstown. We welcome you all again to our reading of God's Word and our chance to make in the wisdom that He has laid there for us in His living Word to His instruction of His people. And we ask that uh, you all keep in His Word day by day, that you listen to that Spirit within you that prompts you to love the Word of God and to study Him day by day and we can enrich your life and keep you on the back path that leads you into life and greater life and future. Uh, as we start today, I'd like to call on the Lord to bless this day. Lord God, I ask you to quicken that spirit in our hearts that gives us a word for you and your word and the wisdom of us. And Lord, I'd like you to touch all those within the sound of my voice to, through your spirit, bring out the wisdom you have for them in your every word today as we read it and speak it and discuss it here around this table. And Lord, I thank you for all those who have brought to view our Bible study either live or in this archive on Facebook. And I thank you for all those who are brought here tonight into this structure center so that we might serve them as Jesus would serve them, showing them the love of Christ in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, for any of you who would like to come by and visit us, if you have not, if you have come by the Facebook page and just found this in the winter mouth, we have free parking, free shower, food, staff bar for 24 hours, free laundry facilities, and we'd be glad to serve all of you. Trying to make you a little better off when you leave than when you come in. But tonight, right now, we're starting in chapter 18 of the book of Leviticus. 70? 70, right. <laughs> I'm ahead of myself because I'm doing my notes. 17 of the chapter of Leviticus, which is really short. We finished 16 last time, and so we're starting in 17 as only would be proper. Uh, would you like to start reading right here, verses 1 through 9? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, to his sons. <coughs> and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meetings, to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord. The guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end of, of the, to, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the meetings, to the priests, and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the priests shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meetings, and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons, after whom they have played the harlot, they should be. This should be a statue forever for them throughout the generations. 
and ye shall say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meetings to offer to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among the people. So we have in the law, laws about the preservation of the honor of those sacrifices of atonement, those offerings of praise as well. It says that no sacrifice will be offered other than by the priests after the fashion that God has laid down. So remember that as soon as the tabernacle started up and the priests had been uh, sanctified to it, Aaron's sons decided to do it their own way and burn their own incense at their own time and were struck dead, therefore. Before that, while God was trying to give the tabernacle worship and the law to Moses up on the mountain, uh, they built the golden calf for themselves and decided to jump the gun and try and worship in their own way. Likewise, they died. This is a passage to maintain the sanctity of that worship that God has laid out so we can do it in his way in the proper way and abide in his joy therefrom. You don't do it anywhere other than through the tabernacle upon pain of death. That is where you bring your sacrifices, verse 1 through 9. And the statute it makes all sacrifices brought to God's altar, that one altar in the tabernacle. Now, beforehand, it was stood differently before the tabernacle worship. It was allowed to all people to build altars and offer sacrifices when they pleased. Uh, Abraham built an altar pretty much any place he pitched his tent. He would give thanks to the Lord wherever he settled down in his wanderings. In Job chapter 1 and verse 5, we read, And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sacrificed them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. People would make their sacrifices in their own place, where they worshiped God. That liberty, however, had been an occasion for idolatry. They had offered their sacrifices to demons, it says, in verse 7. They had gone off and gone after other gods. This law said it back. Rather than forbid them killing any beasts at all, in the field it meant killing them for sacrifices anywhere but at God's altar. They could not offer sacrifices anymore as they had done in the open field, it says in verse 5. And this would be a statute forever in verse 7. As long as the tabernacle and this law should abide, the guilt was very great for those who did so. Blood is impugned on the man that has shed blood, it says in verse 4. Idolatrous sacrifices were looked upon uh, not only as adultery, going after other strange gods, but as murder. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 3, the prophet writes, He that killeth an ox as if he slew a man, he that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck, he that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood, he that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abomination. These unlawful offerings made by people going after their own ways. Yes. The punishment for that was severe. A man would be cut off from his people. Yes. This would prevent idolatry and superstition. All would come to the one temple 
that the priests would do things in God's prescribed way. It secured the honor of the temple and altar. The proper honor and reverence for the place where God wrote them and received them. And it preserved unity and brotherly love among the Israelites. Those who congregate together stay in unity and love one another as brothers, as we are all commanded not to uh, for, not to forget to congregate together as Christians. Now this law was observed with great zeal among the Israelites in general. Those who erected their own altars, there's, there's were come against with zeal in Joshua 22, verse 15 and 16. And they came unto the children of Reuben, and to the children of Gad, and to the half tribe of Manasseh, unto the land of Gilead. And they spake with them, saying, Thus saith the whole congregation of the Lord. What trespass is this that ye have committed against the God of Israel? To turn away this day from following the Lord, and that he had builded you an altar, that ye might rebel this day against the Lord. And so those two and a half tribes were set against for breaking this very commandment. For many ages, breaching this law was a corruption of the Jewish church, one of the chief points. Uh, many times in the histories of the kings of Israel, even for the good kings, we read that the king did well, howbeit, it will say, the high places were not taken away. And over and over they failed to do away entirely with the pagan things among them. But this law in extraordinary cases, despite their zeal for it, could be dispensed with. Gideon's sacrifice in Judges 6.26, Manoah's in Judges 13.19, Samuel made sacrifice in 1 Samuel 7, 9 and 9, 13 and 11, 15. David in 2 Samuel 24, 18. Elijah made a sacrifice away from the temple in 1 Kings 18, 23. All those were accepted. Uh, some think that after the desolation of Shiloh and before the building of the temple, while the ark and altar the ark and altar were unsettled at that time, that it was more allowable for sacrifices elsewhere. Now, how does this matter stand now? We no longer have the old tabernacle made by the hands of man. Now we are under the covenant of grace. In John 4 and verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when he shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. And Malachi 1 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. And so today, our worship is everywhere. Christ is our altar. He is the true tabernacle. As in Hebrews 8.2, we read, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Or in Hebrews 8.2, more twice. <laughs> the sacrifices are acceptable to God. 
and in him only. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones, he's speaking to us as believers, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We are as stones built into the house of God. We, the visible body of Christ on earth. They also are a holy priesthood. Christ be that high priest, through which our sacrifices of praise, devotion, and obedience are acceptable to God wherever we go. Taking our true tabernacle with us, Christ who is always with us. To set up other altars or other sacrifices would be in effect to set up other gods than that we have in Christ. And we're also told to have respect, as they did, to the tabernacle. Respect for the public worship of God. Uh, in Hebrews 10 and verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of son is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so this as in the Leviticus, they were exhorted to bring their sacrifices to the tabernacle. We are exhorted to bring ourselves together in corporate worship as a church, that we might worship God in a holy place, which today is any place where they worship God. For that worship makes it holy. The Holy Spirit joining us there and manifesting among us wherever we are. Okay, now, the next section is 10 16. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that he does any matter of blood, I will even set my face against that soul to be of blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is the blood, and I have given it to you, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I say unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which toucheth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eat. He shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life, therefore, thereof. Therefore I say unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. Then shall he be clean. For if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Now here again, this is for the respect the atonement of that which is given upon the altar to God. In Hebrews, let's see, that's not good. Okay. Now, this is a repetition of a uh, previous Levitical argument in chapter 3 and in chapter 7. It also has a place in the precepts of Noah back in Genesis 9. But here it's made binding not just on the house of Israel, but also on all strangers who sojourn among them in verse 10. And the penalty is very severe, likewise. I will even set my face against that soul that he is blood. If he do it presumptuously and will cut it off, 
And again, verse 14 again says, he shall be cut off. And the reason is given because it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. This is a thing offered to the Lord in the tabernacle. And it will be kept holy and respected and reserved for just that purpose. Now this reason has superseded that. This was a ceremonial law, even to the ceremonies of the tabernacle, which is past. And there are some precepts then given here, but it is enough. They speak about blood that take when hunting, verse 13, to pour it out and cover it in dust. And in verse 15, to not eat anything which is died of itself or is torn with beasts. And that is the end of chapter 17 for maintaining the holiness and sanctity of the tabernacle. In verse now, in chapter 18, as we begin, there's a law against conformity to the corrupt things of the heathen about it. And then some particular laws against incense, beastly lust, barbarous idolatries. And the enforcement of that law from the ruin of the Canaanites. Uh, first section is verse 1 to 5. <clears throat> then the Lord spoke to Moses, <clears throat> saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God, according to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwell. Ye shall not do, and according to the doings of the land of Canaan, which I am bringing you, bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgment and my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. This gives us the authority by which this law is enacted. I am the Lord your God. In verse 1 and verse 4, later in verse 30. I am the Lord. Then there's a strict passage about retaining the relics of the idolatries of Egypt, the Egyptians that they lived among for so long. They had dwelt there and had received an infection of those idolatries. Likewise, as they were going to Canaan among idolatrous people, they could pick up idolatry there and they were warned against it. In verse 3, then there's a solemn charge to them to keep God's judgments, statutes, and ordinances in verse 4 and 5. The great advantage of our obedience, it tells us, which if a man do, he shall live in them. He shall be happy there and thereafter, living in the ordinances of God. They were for our good. We should do them. And that still enforces a promise. We keep God's commandments with sincerity, although we will come short of sinless perfection, we'll find that doing our duty is a way of comfort, a way of happiness. First uh, Timothy 4 and verse 8 says, For bodily exercise, profit little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness benefits us in every way. Uh, now, this is not so much, of course, we have to remember that uh, the least transgression will forever exclude you from that life. Righteousness by the law, described in Romans 10 and verse 5, for Moses described the righteousness which is of the law in Rome. 
that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now that law is not by faith, but of the work you do. Galatians 3 and verse 12 says, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. The man that does them will live, but the law could not give life. As it says, the law was weak to the flesh. That's our flesh. That we could not keep the law holy. We will sin. We will not keep the entirety of the law. We cannot live through that. Though, if we sincerely attempt to keep the law, but it will be tangible benefits. But the man who does them shall live by faith in the Son of God. We owe our life to the grace of Christ and not the merit of our works. In Galatians 3, starting in verse 21 and 22, is the law then against the promise of God? It asks. God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, very righteousness should have been the law. But the scripture has concluded all under the sun and all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The just shall live, those that follow the law, follow justice, but they shall live by faith, by virtue of the name of Christ, who lived their life. The scripture, as it says in Galatians, has concluded that we are all under sin. We cannot keep the law entirely. We don't find righteousness to our works. Our works tend to be unrighteous sometimes. But Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ, is given to them for believing. Our saving grace through faith. Now the next section is uh, six to eighteen. The value of but for this 18 verse 6. None of these shall approach to any that is near kin, to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father and the nakedness of thy mother shall thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife. Shalt thou not uncover? It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, of thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, Begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. She is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach his wife, for she is thy aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover their nakedness. For they are her near kinswomen. It is wickedness. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Now these all relate to the seventh commandment about uh, untoward practices for females. It's forbidden 
as to the relation specified, right? approaching them to uncover their names, as it says in verse 6. This is teaching to forbid marrying among any of these relations. There are reasons for this. Marriage is supposed to take two who are apart and make them one flesh. It's designed to unite those who were not before united. And those relatives are already close. But marriage also puts an equality between husband and wife. One is the husband of one, the other the wife of the other. Uh, if those who are in a superior and inferior relationship, like a father or a mother and their children, or an aunt or an uncle, nieces, if those were to be uh, brought together equally, the order of nature would be taken away. No relations that are equal are forbidden, except brothers and sisters. Whether by whole blood or half blood or by marriage. Now, the law that forbids marrying a brother's wife in verse 16 had an exception peculiar to the Jewish state. If a man dies without uh, a son, his brother or next of kin would marry the widow and raise up seed for the deceased. Deuteronomy 25 5 gives us this. Uh, where it reads, if brethren go together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto the stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in into her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of the husband's brother unto her. Now this is the reason which held good in that nation as in order for the inheritance to stay within that tribe, you needed someone from that tribe to be the father. It was to carry on the family and keep the property within the same people instead of remarrying off and then uh, having the property handed out piecemeal if someone died that way. Uh, today, uh, anyone can inherit property even uh, female children, and, and so we don't have to do that. Okay, the next section goes from 19 down to the end of 30. Also, you shall not approach a woman <clears throat> to uncover her nakedness as long as she is in her customary impurity. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defy yourself with her. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to the moment nor shall ye profane the name of, of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now shall you mate with any animal to defy yourself with it? Now shall any woman stand before an animal to, to mate with it? It is a perversion. Do not defy yourself with any of these things. For by all these things the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled. Therefore, I visit the punishment of the inequities upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. He shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nations or any stranger who dwells among you. For all of these abominations the man of the land has done. Who were before you, and thus the land is divided. Lest the land vomit you out also when you defy it, and it vomits out the nations that were before you. For whoever commits any of these abominations 
the person who commits them shall be cut off from among the people. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinances so that you do not commit any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you do not defile yourself by them. I am the Lord your God. Right. The honor of the marriage bed and the preservation of proper relations again. It should not be unseasonably used, it says in verse 19, nor uh, invaded by adultery. Must remember that women during their uh, uh, menstruation were considered unclean. It was the all for a few days. And so one does not lay with them unclean. That relates to that ritual law of uncleanliness. Nor they by adultery. Adultery, of course, being forbidden. And then we have verse 21, the law against causing their children to pass through the fire to Moloch, the sacrifice to that pagan god. In Ezekiel 16 and verse 20, it says, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. In this of thy whoredoms is a small matter. Acting through such idolatry as though they had a greater debt to Moloch than they had to Jehovah. For they offer only cattle to Jehovah, but their children to these outer gods. Then we come to laws against unnatural lusts, sodomy, bestiality, most uh, abominable things in verse 22 and 23. In Romans 1.24, we can see how men are given up to such vile affections frequently as a punishment for their idolatry. If they are, are cut off from the body of Christ and given for the corruption of flesh to show them their sin, this is one of the things they have as it were a curse. Romans 1 and 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness to the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, the Lord has an undisputable right to demand this, but he speaks to us as children and as friends, and here he deals with us uh, and, and uh, condescends to reason with us and give us reasons for these things. First, the sinners defile themselves with these abominations. Defile not yourselves any of these things, he says in verse 24. Also, the soul to commit these will be cut off from his people. First Corinthians 3.17 again says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? Remembering that we are uh, are uh, the proof that is the substance of the old temple, which was a shadow, just as Christ is the truth and substance of the old high priest, the Judeo-High priesthood. The land likewise is defiled, it says in verse 25. If such wickedness as these is practiced, the land is made unfit that God's tabernacle should be in it. And these abominations are of the former inhabitants of the lands which they would now take. It mentions in verse 24 and 27. It's for these very sins that the Canaanites were to be destroyed. Way back in Genesis 15 and verse 16, you remember that God said, but in the fourth generation, 
they shall come hither again. That is, the Israelites could come out of Egypt, but not until the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites, says Genesis 15 and 16, is not yet told. God was waiting for them to go kill the of sin before he destroyed them. And it's for these iniquities that he did destroy them. He visits the iniquity thereof upon it, he says in verse 25. He also asks they take heed that the land not spit them out also, as it will spit out the Canaanites that they will place. Romans 11, starting in verse 19, says, Thou didn't say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. That's us. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, that is, those of his people Israel, who did not believe. Take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, or that which fell severity, but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. If God would not spare his own people when they continued in sin, we have no reason to believe he will not cut us off, we being only grafted in to what he started. Now, the chapter concludes with an antidote against the infection of these barbaric practices. Therefore, you shall keep my ordinances that you commit not to me in these abominable customs. And verse 30, a close and continual sincere adherence to God's ordinances. It is the most effective preservative from the infection of gross sin. Stay in his ordinances, practice them, and they will make you a more righteous person. You will never be perfect. But our Lord has covered our sin. He has washed it away with his blood. He will separate from himself as far as the east is from the west. Through our faith in Jesus Christ, God gives us that grace. It is the grace of God only that secures us. And that grace is expected only by using the means of grace that he's given us. God doesn't ever leave any to their own heart's lusts until they first leave him and his institution. If you stay with your faith in God and your sincere will to obey him, he will not let you fall entirely. He will bear you up. He will give you wisdom. He will give you faith. And that is the end of chapter 18 but we'll have to stop this night. And do you have anything to add, Christy? Uh, only from the fact that we use that Elizabeth 17 money there for <clears throat> our God's time for our uh, uh, Yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, that being the end of our Bible study, let us thank the Lord for our time. Father God, 
I thank you for bringing us here. And I ask you, Lord, to be with all those who are here tonight as they go out and all those out there on the road. I ask that you would, for my mama, I ask that you would send your angels before them to spring every crack of the enemy. I ask that you would protect them from all the hazards, both physical and spiritual, of the road. I ask that you would quicken that spirit in them that will draw them to your word. And I would ask that you will bring them around here one day that we might serve them in your name. Safe and sound. Blessed in their coming and their going. And in Jesus' name, I pray, amen. And that's back to our Bible study this evening. Yeah. 